everybody, and welcome to this week's episode of Soapbox. I'm your host, Mickey Angeline. Today's show is going to be fabulous because we've got a special guest today, Laura Rubacalba, to talk about her visit. She went abroad. But before we get into that, we would like to give a shout out to some of our sponsors. Pieces Pizza, Pizza by the Slice, located on 21st Street between Capitol and Ann in downtown Sacramento. Known for vegan options as well. They've been a longtime supporter of Soapbox and they do their best to feed our crew. We love them lots. That's Pieces Pizza by the Slice. And Humor Times by James Israel. It's a comic satire chucked full of cartoons on everything political. They even include columns by Jim Hightower and Will Durst. And lastly, we want to make sure that you like us on Facebook. Just go to Soapbox Sacramento, which is at Soapbox Sac. Like us and follow us to learn of all the shows coming up. And also, we'd like to announce that we now have a YouTube channel. So make sure to subscribe and never miss a show. That is Soapbox Sacramento on YouTube. All right, so let's get to the nitty gritty. So I'd like to welcome our guest, Laura Rubacalba, who incidentally used to host Soapbox. And for how long uh, were you a host on the show? I was a host for maybe about four or five shows last year. Nice. And then so you took a break and you went somewhere. You were gone for about six months to a country called, well, okay, us in America, we call it Uruguay, but apparently it's actually pronounced Uruguay. Uruguay. Now we've been educated. <laughs> and what brought you out to Uruguay? Why did you pick that spot? Well, I was looking for a place um, that had progressive politics. That's really important to me. And uh, I was also looking for location because a lot of the places in the, in the world that have progressive politics are in cold climates and I didn't want to be cold. <laughs> so that was how it started out. But actually the, the, the location became more important to me that it was in the southern hemisphere because in in today's world we have a lot of war drums being beaten beat between the u.s and russia between right. israel and everybody else iran the refugees going through europe brexit and all of this stuff and the terrorism is all in the northern hemisphere any conflicts you have in the southern hemisphere are civil conflicts they're constrained within a country it's not one country going on to another country so when I was down there for six months, you know, and I was reading scary things like, you know, the, the shootings that took place in Orlando right. or Dallas, or I was reading about, you know, things between countries in Europe or Brexit and all of this turmoil, it was like, oh my God, I'm way down here. I'm on the other side of the world. So that location came to be kind of important, not just because of the climate, but just politically to be far away as, from, from as problems. possible, right. But the progressiveness was like the major thing in Uruguay, Uruguay, Uruguay has legal marijuana, legal gay marriage, universal health care, free education, they get 95% of their electricity from renewables, and they just pulled out of TISA, the Trade and Services Agreement, these trade partnerships that are, everybody's going into that, that you know, people have heard about the TPP, the TISA is similar. And so I'm really proud. You know, Uruguay is small. It's the size of Oklahoma, three and a half million people. Yeah, you were saying that, not very big at all. Not big at all, but they're small, but they're like mighty, like they stand up. And so I'm really proud of them for that. So um, Uruguay, it's, it's really interesting because they, they are a, a country that was settled a lot like the US. So 85% of the people in Uruguay are of European descent, mostly from Italy, Spain, and Portugal. So they're 85% white. You think of a South American country, you're thinking of Mexicans. Like we think Mexicans as everything below, you know, the U.S. But, right. but it's not true at all. And so, so Uruguay um, had a lot of people coming from all over the place. And the Oriental Republic of Uruguay was established in 1828. Um, and it was actually... A, <laughs> it was actually established by Britain because um, Uruguay is between Brazil and Argentina. And Brazil and Argentina, they were fighting back and forth over their border. And so Britain created Uruguay between the two to stop the fighting. And that's how the Oriental public of Uruguay came to be. That is interesting fact. To stop the border wow. dispute between Argentina and Brazil. Okay. 
Explains why it's small. <laughs> and it has a, a like a river along one border, so it makes sense what one border is, but I don't know how they really established the, the other, other one. one. Yeah. So, um, you know, I did a lot of research before I left on the internet, and I was able to find out like Uruguay, Uruguay has the highest standard of living in South America, the least corrupt government, as rated by the people who live there. Right. Um, it's a constitutional democracy, so it has a president, it has a judicial system, it has a bicameral, so it has like a Senate and a House similar to what we have, and they have elections every five years, and the president is um, elected for five years and they can't run for consecutive terms, which is kind of nice because then you don't have that, that thing where the, what do they call it? Well, that? ten years would be too long, I think. Well, to have like one here, whenever office. we elect a president, they end up going for eight years. Correct. They end up doing Most two terms because you have that incumbent advantage. Right. And so that the president doesn't have that. It's going to be a new president every, every time. time. Right. So that's going to. Well, nice. do you think all this progression? Do you think it's because it's so small? Um, and it's easier for a smaller group of people to to get together and decide effectively what's best for its country. I don't know. I don't. I don't think that has to do with it. South America in general has had very progressive and leftist governments historically. Okay. And, um, and a lot of those governments, you know, have been attacked by neoliberal policies from the U.S. over time. Before they were even neoliberal, they were just imperialistic. So I think that they have their progressive politics because that's part of the identity of South America. Um, I think maybe they've been able to sustain who they are because they're small. You know, and because like nobody's really interested in them, they don't have oil, they don't have resources that somebody wants to go in and get. Their main okay. exports are beef, vegetables, you know, they have a lot of cows. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. A lot of cowboys. Interesting. Um, another, so they're, so they're similar to the U.S. in how their political system's set up, but a couple differences is that they have mandatory compulsory voting, so everybody has to vote. And if you don't vote, you're fined. I'll, there's other countries that have this, like Australia, for instance. Um, and so the fine isn't that much, because you really don't want to punish people economically. Right. Um, but if you, don't, if you don't vote, then you have to pay the fine, and that bureau bureaucracy takes a little while. And in the time period before you can pay the fine, you can't sign up for classes at the college. You can't buy or sell property. I don't know what other things you can't do. But you know, you can imagine that would be pretty, pretty pretty, uh, would really encourage a person to vote. Well, and especially yeah, but I mean, to me, the people in college, I love that the people in college, you know, like if I don't vote, then I'm not gonna be able to register for classes because I wanna care what the young people want in the country because they're the ones who are gonna have to live with the decisions. Well, I mean, do you feel that they're also encouraged and it's, they make it easy access and the information provided to them? Um, I don't know a whole lot about that. You know, one of the, the biggest problem I had when I was in Uruguay was learning the language. Uh -huh. Because, like, um, I thought I would go there and I would be immersed and I would learn. And it didn't really work out that way because about half the people speak English. They teach English now in the schools. They secondary language, like two languages. All the kids who come out of the wow. schools know English and Spanish, which is the local language. Okay. And so because of that, you know, everybody was always wanting to practice their English, and their English was better than my Spanish, so I oh, ended goodness. up talking a lot of English with people or talking to people who I had no idea what they were saying because their, their Spanish was really quite different than what I was learning in the way that it sounded. And it's hard to tell when one word ends and it starts another one. It was just really difficult. Interesting. So, but, I, but, but you were asking about motivating people to vote. Right. And another difference... Because that's that, a problem here in the U.S. A, another difference that they have there is they have proportional voting. So from what I understand, I don't know if I've got this entirely correct. This is like looking on the internet and trying to figure it out. <laughs> but um, you vote for the parties. And there's like three major parties, but I think there's five altogether. Okay. And so you vote for a party and if 20% of the population votes for party X, then 20% of the positions in the legislative houses, the Senate and the House, their version of that, their right. Congress, are going to be party X. Interesting. If 5%, then 5% of those positions are going to be party B. Or, wow. Mm -hmm. So here we have winner take all. Right. 
So that proportional voting, I think, I think it really helps other parties, you know, form and stuff. So you pick the party, and if I understand it correctly, the party then picks the people that actually go and serve. But I figure if those people don't do the right thing, then the party's going to pay. So the party is motivated to pick people that are in line. With it's accountability. What, it's accountability. Yeah. Wow. That sounds great. I really liked it a lot. Um, one of the things, you know, when I was doing the research, which was like two years ago, when I started looking around, was this president that they, they had recently, like about, I think, six or eight years ago, they had President Pepe Mujica. And he's mm -hmm. famous throughout the world. He I was like famous. that name. <laughs> he was famous. He was billed as the world's poorest president because he gave 90% of his presidential salary away to charity. Oh, wow. He drove a VW bus. And, you know, we're talking about a, a small country, right? Right. And they were like, okay, so, oh, my God, we're going to have a helicopter, a presidential helicopter. And President Mujico said, I don't need a presidential helicopter. Let's take that helicopter and use it to, you know, for medical purposes. So he turned down the presidential helicopter so that it could be for medical purposes. And you can go like on YouTube and find Mujica, President Mujica speaking, and he talks against consumerism and the, and the importance of community and not chasing dollars and not trading what are really future years of our life when we buy something that's our future labor, not trading our life for worthless goods that we then, you know, put in our closet and then put into a storage container. I mean, we're pretty ridiculous how consumeristic we are. And Mujica was a real person. If you go and you look at his YouTube videos, he talks about consumerism. And he talks about the importance of being human and not a consumer. Have a greater identity than what you buy. Wow, I like this guy. He's awesome. I need to look him up. I like that. And he was, he was a gorilla. He was a gorilla previously. So... Uruguay previously was under a military dictatorship, I think, back in like the 70s. And in the 80s, they came out. So just recently. Yeah, not that long not ago. Not that long ago. And so, and so they came out, and Mujica was one of the people who had been imprisoned by the military previously. So he spent. And this is the same thing in Brazil. Dilma, Dilma Rousseff was also a, a political prisoner for a long time. So they share that. So that must have been quite the change for the people. Did, did it seem or did you learn how well the people received that? Having to going from militant to going with a leader who truly was leading his, his country. Well, so they had the military dictatorship and then they allowed elections, which is just remarkable. And then those elections, you know, elected somebody different than the military leadership, you know, that what they wanted and that stuck and it worked and they were able to build from that. One of the weird things about Uruguay is it seems pretty safe personally when I walk on the streets. Okay. But all of the windows are covered with bars. There's bars on all the windows. Here in the U.S., if I see bars on windows, I'm like, I know I'm in a bad neighborhood. Right. In Uruguay, they're all covered. You can go out four or five stories and there's, I'm like, what do you think? Somebody's going to fly into your, wow. your, your window? But they all cover with bars. And I think that comes from the time when they had military right. dictatorships and they had to like have their own little fort against their own military. Interesting. That is interesting. And as far as security goes, I mean, it was one of the things that I, I really didn't understand because I would see young women at night walking alone at 12, 1, 2 in the morning and completely unworried about being molested. And you would not see that here. No. And so there seemed to be a great deal of personal security, but people were seemed to be very concerned about the security of their home. And I never really understood why, just, just based on all the bars on the windows. Yeah, that's interesting, unless it's to keep them from leaving. That's interesting because when you, <laughs> you said it was a militant, so I'm wondering if, it, if, they, if they had like a, what you call a curfew, and you weren't allowed to. Maybe. And, but, but as far <laughs> as not leaving, like, so when I would stay, so when I went to Uruguay, I went for six months, so I went in February and I came back in August and that would be our summer, but because okay. they're in the Southern Hemisphere, the seasons are reversed, so I was there for winter. Interesting. The one thing you didn't want. Oh no, I right? wanted to see the winter. Okay, okay. So the climate in Uruguay is very similar. Well, if you were to look on the globe, you would see that the latitude okay. is the same as the latitude of San Diego. Okay. That's how far it is from the equator. Right. So it's not near the equator. It's not a, what do you call countries that are near the equator? The kind of 
climate that they have. More tropical? Tropical, yeah. yeah. So this is more... Really humid? So Uruguay is humid. Okay. But um, the winter temperatures are from 40 to 60, and the summer temperatures are from 60 to 80. Oh, wow. It's really even keel. But it's very to, it humid. Is, it's a yeah, very different... Gotcha. Okay. <laughs> Ugh. Okay. And um, so when I got there, so, so one of my strategies to really understand, because I went there to see, is this a place where I want to live? Because I was dissatisfied with the direction that things were going here in the U.S. And, and this is back last year. This is, you know, before, um, before we really got into Clinton and Trump actually being the nominee. This right. Was, and and, I, and I, so what I did was I used Airbnb. And I stayed for a month at a time. And then I would move to the next Airbnb. So I moved about the city. I lived in about seven or eight different places around the city. And was that economical for you? It was economical. It okay. was um, like... Because there's a spike in that here in the U.S. Yes. A lot of, in fact, I saw about seniors who are um, renting, renting out. out their rooms and stuff. And, it's, and it's, it helps supplement their income for their mm -hmm. homes. And it's giving the young people a place to go and it saves them a grip. Yeah, so it was like 500 a month generally for, okay. for me to be able to find a That's place. That's real? 500 a month? It was pretty inexpensive. But that, that would be really renting a room. So that but would be still, renting a room in someone's but house. But still, that's giving you somewhere to stay, and then the rest of it's for your exploring, learning experience, the culture, and the people. Wow, good for you, girl. <laughs> you saved a grip. So, well, because I didn't work. I was originally planning to work when I got there to teach English as a foreign language, but I ended up... You know, it would have, I got trained to do that, but I've never done it. So if okay. I would have actually done that, I felt like I would have spent a lot of time on it because when you do your first year teaching, you have to, it just takes a long time to prepare your lessons, to evaluate everything. And I didn't want to go there and not, and be working all the time and not see what I needed to see. I would have seen stuff working, but I don't know. I was lazy. I just, I just went the easy way. Well, you way. know, I was going to say, you mentioned about you were originally wanting to find work. Was it that it was difficult to find work, or you just kind of changed your mind after you got there? So um, it is generally difficult to find work in Uruguay, but, um, the, but teaching English as a foreign language, those jobs are easy to find. They gotcha. don't pay well. They pay like minimum wage. I mean, similar to what teachers are paid here. I don't think teachers are paid a whole lot here, especially when you look at how much time it takes for grading your papers right. and then preparing the lessons. Oh, yeah, the work they do besides from being in class, yeah. Yeah. Um, so I ended up not working. I spent my time, um, like I said, moving around. It was nice living in different people's houses because I got to really know this person who right. was in Erwashen and, you know, live in their house and see how their day-to-day -day life went. And I moved about the city, so I went to different restaurants in each place that I lived. Okay. I didn't rent a car or anything, so I used the bus all the time. I drank the water. Um, Uruguay has the highest standard of living in South America, and you can drink the water. Oh, we have pictures. We do. This is from your trip, right? Yes, this is um, the architecture. There's a real culture in Uruguay that, that was, I, I, I was stunned with. And so um, the architecture is beautiful. It, it, it's very European. It looks like an old European city. And the, but on the other hand, it's quite falling apart. It's quite, it's not maintained. So you see this grand old European. That's what it looks like. It does not look like what we would think a Latin American country looks like. It looks like Europe. Um, so these are really nice pictures of different, different nice The street looks very clean. Yeah, <laughs> and generally the streets were not clean, so apparently my pictures are not a good documentation. Aha. Uh -huh. This is one of the cemeteries. Um, I just found the cemeteries amazing because the, the way wow. people put all of all of these these uh, you see a lot of angels here, but they yeah. had all kinds of crazy things that that, and I'm like, so you're dead now, so <laughs> who cares what you put? Um, there was a lot of graffiti, and a lot of it had political messages, um, here, money and death, right, right, bleeding. Um, they are quite like uh, leftist. I, I would see anarchist signs. Um, That's you know, crazy. Quite a I, there, there you was, go right there too. Yeah, so this one here, ACAB, that stands for All Cops Are Bastards. Whoa. And I love how they put it in sign language. I was say because, oh my. <laughs> All Cops Are Bastards, yep, there it is. Wow. 
So that was pretty funny. Um, this is the Japanese garden. Uh, they, they have beautiful parks and gardens. They're, they're free. The museums are free. What? So I, I went to Montevideo. This is the, the lake at Parque Redo. Just more examples of the public spaces. I went to Montevideo, which is um, kind of similar to Sacramento. It's the capital of the country. Here you see just the public space and people just using the public space. And they, um, oh, I want to talk about the Rambla. So the Rambla has actually been suggested to be a World Heritage Site. The Rambla is the, the public strip of area along the coast. Okay. So Uruguay. So that's what this is here? Yes. That's along the coast. On the, okay. left, on the left, you see the public strip. And then on the right, you see the, the, the coast. And it's ocean, the Atlantic, and river. A really wide river. A river so wide, wide that you can't see the other shore. That's really wide. Very wide. And so they have 900 miles of coastline. And a great deal of it, hundreds of miles, is this public walkway. And the people of Uruguay in the summer, they go there. They go to the beach, they go to the Rambla, they walk along the Rambla, they bicycle along the Rambla. It is their space. Here in the US, you know, you can take US 101 and in some of the way you can be next to the coast. But rarely is that a public area that you can access directly to True. the beach. In Uruguay, that's publicly owned. There is not houses or um, hotels right, businesses generally and restaurants between, and between that public space and the water. So it's really nice. And, and the Rambla, the people spend a lot of time in the Rambla. So would you say overall your experience, was it everything you'd hoped for? Was there surprises? Yes. Um, so I looked at everything and you know you can tell a little bit on the internet, but when I actually went there, what I saw that really surprised me was the way that the people the, just the differences in the culture between here and there. And a big difference was the people are, they have a lot more freedom than we do. Um, marijuana is legal, recreational use, anywhere you can smoke. So you can smoke marijuana in the streets, in the parks, in the public spaces. The same thing with alcohol. People go and buy a liter of beer with uh -huh. their friends and they're in the park drinking the alcohol. They don't seem to have problems. I didn't see binge drinking. Right. And I think it's because they don't have like a two o'clock closing. It, it's like all night into the morning. So I think they just got to pace themselves. So they don't really and drink a whole lot. There's a, it looks like a, your oh, Facebook. Yeah. For more information, I did do a Facebook page uh, okay. called Laura Post from Oderwine. And you can see some of the stuff I posted there. It wasn't a lot, but you awesome. know, over six months, there's quite a few. I bet. Well, it sounds like because of them not having the issues with uh, crime or, or being attacked is why there wasn't an issue with public display of the smoking of the marijuana or even the drinking, especially like drinking and driving is an issue here. Oh, no. Drinking and driving was very serious there. As really? serious as here, drinking and oh, driving. Oh, okay. But, you know, I mean, really, why do we have public drunkenness being, you know, why isn't it what you do while you're drunk, what you do that actually hurts somebody that's legal? Well, illegal, right. you know, why is drinking in itself? I saw people drinking and they were not a problem. If okay. they were a problem, they were breaking laws, then fine. But the fact that they have these things that are not um, illegal means they have a lot less cops. They have a lot more freedom there. They, they, they believe in community, they don't, their incarceration rate in, in the US, which is the highest in the world, is 716 per 100,000 persons. In Uruguay, it's 209. Um, prostitution is not illegal. So a lot of things that, you know, we yeah. use, that we, <laughs> that we use cop resources on, right. right, aren't being used. It was a funny story. One time I was riding the bus late at night. It was in the wee hours of the morning coming back from watching some music, and these cops get on the bus. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? They were riding the bus. That's it. They were just riding How the bus. How funny. Yeah. So it's a different feel because from here, especially in light of what's been going on recently with, um, you know, officers yep. abusing their yep. authority. There were a lot less police and they're not, you know, they're not empowered to go around policing people. Gotcha. So, because so, everyone's just kind of accountable for themselves and believing in community and so all the a, things we would love to see here more, right? There's a lot of tranquilo. <laughs> it's very nice. Um, 
Another interesting thing there is that the youth, when they break laws, are not put in jail. They don't have imprisonment of the youth. They're put in halfway houses and there's work on rehabilitation. This kind of causes problems because sometimes the youth kill people and people feel like they should go to jail. So they're kind of working their way through it. Um, and interestingly, they didn't legalize marijuana because people wanted to smoke marijuana. They legalized marijuana because they wanted to deprive funding to to, oh. to yes. All right. So, you know, I chose to go to Uruguay, but um, other people. I mean, not, would you recommend it for it, yeah. everybody or? Well, it's, it's expensive. Okay. But uh, it's, it's easy to immigrate. That's another reason I chose it. You can own property and you can easily immigrate. But, you know, some people don't have money yet to be able to go to Uruguay. It's more and a place to retire. And when you say it's retire. expensive, like what things are expensive? Um, the, the housing is not quite as expensive here, but the food is, is about the same. The energy is higher. Imports, they have a high value added tax. Imports gotcha. are very expensive. But um, one of the things I did to prepare was I got, I got my certified to teach English as a foreign language. And this was something I did right here in Sacramento. I went to Sac City College. It was three weekends in a month. So in one month, I got my certification. I got uh, it was like eleven $1 hundred dollars and forty hours online afterwards, and I was certified, and I could teach anywhere in the world, and they would help me find a job, and everything. And I think young people, this could be a real option for them instead of going into debt to get a degree that you don't even know if you can find a yeah, job. Yeah, that's a big problem. You know, for, for a couple thousand dollars, you can pay for the certificate, you can pay for your plane trip, and places will pay you to teach, and you can you know explore the world. Well, it sounds like all in all, it was a wonderful visit. I want to thank you so much for Laura for being on the show and sharing this with us. Definitely uh, visit her website uh, if you want to see more pictures. Laura Rubicalba is the name, right? Posts from Europe. Laura posts from Uruguay. 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 <laughs> so um, I have a little video of the candombe, which is a street drumming. Okay. They had a lot of art and music there, and, and so I, I brought this little video we could close out with when. It's only like a minute long. If we can, if you wanted to now, that would be great. There it is.